thanks uh, Shanti and Satya. The floor is now open for questions. Are there any questions for the audience? Yeah, Jay, please come forward. Is this what Hello, is this what Hi, Shetri, good to see you again. So, if you look at the most of the attacks that are being done currently on supposedly cryptographically secure systems, they don't come from a direct attack board. But from indirect mechanisms like using over channels or five channels using hardware timing attacks and so on. To be part of what are your thoughts on how far we have to go to prevent these side channels also from adversely affecting the security of the system? Would you hear that question? Shafi, would you hear that question? I didn't hear it. If you can repeat it. Or somebody can repeat it closer to the mic. I'm not sure I understood it. Is the question to me? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now, oh, Not me. Maybe I can repeat it. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe I just answer. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps uh, Jan could use Shweta's mic. But basically, my my interpretation of the question, Shafi, is about side channels. Right. Yeah. So uh, we spent so much effort in theory of the way systems to make it graphically secure, but most of the attacks on these systems today will come directly from trying to break the code, but from indirect attacks like using over channels or side channels, using especially hardware having attacks. So, could we comment on uh, whether there's been sufficient progress on addressing the side channel problem in, the, in, 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 the, uh, in, in terms of addressing the security of the systems? Uh, what do you think remains to be done? Okay, so I think the way, the way I hear it, there uh, the question has two interpretations. One is a uh, more general one, and that is uh, suppose there are side channels. Are they taken into uh, consideration when we say that a cryptographic solution is secure? So there was a period of time where there was a very active research area of how to, first of all, model mathematically a side channel attack. And usually the model, the cleanest one, is that there's some way, we have no idea how, it could be a variety of ways, but at the end of which, in addition to seeing what you are allowed to see in the definition of the cryptographic system, you also see some function of the secret information, whether it's a secret key or something that was supposed to kept, be kept completely secret memory, you, uh, but you don't see it all, but you see, uh, you can think of it as either uh, it's somebody applied a, a, a function to it and the, the function is compressing. Or you can think of it this way, somebody applied a function, gets the result of that function, but still there remains some entropy that's hidden. So some uh, key bits are, have not been revealed. And now the question is, if you add this channel to everything else, is the system still secure? So usually if you look at, you know, a traditional based system like RSA based or discrete log based, you can pretty quickly show that if you find a lot of bits or a significant fraction of bits from the secret key, you can break it. But systems have been designed to even um, be secure against that kind of leak, but they're not based, they're not RSA, it's not RSA. So there are systems based on uh, learning with errors where you can show that even if you uh, leaked uh, through a side channel attack, you know, close to one minus epsilon fraction of the bits, but you still left some uh, some entropy that's secret, the system is still secure. So that's one family of results that can address the side channel thing. Um, of course, you could say, well, why one minus epsilon? We're gonna keep on leaking, keep on leaking every time, there, over time, and then eventually everything's gonna leak. There's even been systems that have been designed to address this type of attack, where you're continuously refreshing the secret key, even though you may maintaining the same public key or, or public signature key. Um, and that's a mathematical challenge, but such things exist. The other interpretation of your question 
is that you're saying that hardware uh, devices, so you're thinking that there's some sort of, the scheme is based on secure hardware, but it's not really secure because there are side channels. Um, I think secure hardware is a, is a tough assumption to, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. You know, there's often breaks that you didn't anticipate. But Satya, maybe you saw something else in this question in addition. Um, no, Shafi, I think, uh, yeah, I, my interpretation is the same. Uh, well, unless Jayanth had more clarifications to make. Well, that's fine, thanks. Uh, Shafi, thank you. Any other thanks, Uh, hi, Matt. Uh, so your information and your work about uh, translation from Braille language to uh, English is something that is very exciting to me. Uh, and person is passionate about animals. Uh, I think that is a very uh, great work that you are doing. Can you share some more, maybe some something that you, you have been able to achieve uh, in this uh, in this Area. And uh, Satya talked about uh, using that method to translate uh, ancient uh, texts. Can we look beyond us, beyond Earth? And uh, we need to use so the Sita project is where we are capturing information and radiation. And the uh, best that we are able to do is to capture just the word wow. Uh, can uh, your method be used uh, to uh, decipher maybe some information? Uh, from the radiation that we captured from the outer space. Uh, maybe we can capture uh, a little bit talking. So if, if I if, if I heard correctly, you're asking about the whale communication project and whether some of those methods could be applicable to uh, decode something from outer space. Is that correct? Yes. Is that the question? Yes, sir. Okay. So first of all, this research, this question about whether we can even detect that there is some uh, communication that's happening, and it's not just random noise in outer space. Madhu Sudan and uh, Odette Goldreich and, um, and uh, Juba have a paper on, a few, couple of papers on this in the past. Uh, so the way they, what they are talking about is that they just want to be able to distinguish whether it's noise, say, say you don't know the language, and but there is this entity out there. How do you, first of all, distinguish that there is some communication uh, signal coming? And if so, how do you communicate if you don't know the language? They were trying to communicate, and then they they defined it as um, uh, there's a goal, and whether you can achieve a goal or not achieve a goal, even if you don't know each other's language, by some coming up with some form of communication. But um, it's uh, so there is actually work on that. It's not my work. In terms of the whale thing, you know, at this point, there is the effort is to collect data, and after you collect it, to try to find. Uh, confirmation of what we believe are the discrete, like codas are called, sort of the, kind of the discrete almost alphabet and the discrete words, if you like. Uh, and uh, and then there's a question of meaning. So of course, as a theorist, we would like to give a whole solution to the thing to say, you've got these two languages, let's say whales, people, they have nothing in common linguistically. They probably don't have enough in, in common in terms of domain. Uh, there's a huge domain gap. Uh, what could you do in such a case? And you come up with a theory of what you could do. We're not at the stage where we've actually done this uh, successfully. We're still even at the stage of collecting data. But at least it gives you some bounds on how much data you'd have to collect, even have a chance to address it. So it, to answer your question, this extraterrestrial and the whales, maybe they'll be, we could inform each other, but at this point, uh, they're separate theories and to, also the whale thing, it's its in such an infancy. But it's fairly clear to me, you know, if we can do what we can do now with ChatGPT and, 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 and language models, why shouldn't we be able to understand this corpus of data, assuming that there's it's a complex enough language it has, that it's not just a trivial language. Thank you. Can I, can I add a couple of sentences, um, Shafi? Uh, one is uh, if if people haven't seen this movie called Arrival, they should go see it. Um, you know that answers you know some uh, interesting ways how alien communication could perhaps be 
decoded using linguistic technology. There is some serious behind you know, uh, that movie. Now, on, on a more serious note, yeah, I agree with uh, Shafi about uh, the paper work by Madhusudan and uh, Goldreich and others on uh, semantic communication. This paper is called Universal Semantic Communication. And that really is a good theoretical foundation for interpreting you know, um, languages that we may not have seen before, communication patterns in, in general, not necessarily just languages, but communication patterns uh, you know, from life forms that we may not have seen before. That, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. So the idea there is that you want to communicate with them. It's not that you're trying to understand them necessarily. And, and when you say they communicate, I, it's communicate to establish, to accomplish a goal. Is there some, where a goal no. might be something not, it's not that you're talking about a topic, but you're trying to say that this communication has been successful if something has been achieved that you couldn't have achieved before. Yeah. So my question is that uh, even though we follow the zero trust model, social engineering, social engineering is something where uh, cryptography kind of fails sometimes. So in the in the future, can we expect more much better models or technology which can reduce the amount of social engineering attacks? Can Can you repeat? I I didn't catch it. My question is that even though we follow the zero trust model. Still, social engineering is something where cryptography fails. Sometimes people tend to give their private keys to someone just because they are social engineering. So, in the future, can we expect much better technologies or much better models which can reduce the amount of social engineering attacks? Um, Shweta, do you mind maybe repeating the question? I'm not sure if we. I, I don't know. Shafi, did you understand the question? Actually, no, but it's not. I can repeat the question, although I myself don't understand it fully. Uh, the question is, uh, there are uh, a lot of attacks in social engineering, even though we're following the zero trust model. And can we in the future expect uh, better cryptography and better technology that can prevent social engineering attacks? Uh, social engineering. Um... I'm not even sure what that is. Uh, but that I said I couldn't understand. Maybe can you tell us what you mean? It's basically when people are tricked to give their target keys or then they do authentication or whenever we see that the private keys are being handed over to other people and uh, adversaries usually take advantage of their keys, private keys. So to repeat the answer, it's when people hand over their private keys to the adversary. Ah. Ah, 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 I see what you mean. Uh, so you mean when you say, in some sense, you're saying it's, it's the fact that people don't follow the rules of the protocol and that they leave their passwords everywhere and that they just don't, you know, they don't, uh, they don't follow security practices. Well, that's a big problem. Um, I guess, I guess the one thing you could say about it is that if you think of cryptography as a system effort rather than a single effort of a key, of a user, but let's say that you would like to ensure that an infrastructure is secure rather than your private information. And that will depend on, uh, on, on, on let's say, a, a, it will be in a distributed setting where there are many, many participants. And the, assumption is not, and the assumption is that there's some majority that follows the rules or that there's enough, uh, and if it's a majority, if you need a strict majority, but you have enough uh, people who follow the rules. And if that's the case, then the system is secure. Maybe that's the uh, that's the answer that you'd like to not have important security breaches be dependent on some individual um, being careless with the keys, but it would have to have you know many it, it would you know that you'd have to have some sort of consensus by many, and it would be possibly the belief that not all of them are going to be careless with the keys. So maybe that's the risk. The answer about your personal privacy if you're going to leave, give, give your keys to someone else i don't think you should have any privacy but in terms of uh, from a system-wide perspective of having security uh then i think that we have a chance with things like like the blockchains but not necessarily blockchain but something where there's a large number of components that have to fail before the whole thing fails and 
Hello, uh, can you hear me? Great. Uh, so my question follows up on the previous question, actually. I think it's a very important question. Um, I think part of it is educating people about cryptographic techniques and not just computer scientists, but the population in general about cryptographic techniques and the security problems that happen. Um, in general, crypto techniques are very, very difficult for uh, people to understand. So do you have any thoughts on how you can popularize these techniques and also the attacks um, that they prevent? Um, I guess maybe one answer to your question is that rather than thinking about keys and mathematics, uh, make schemes which are more user friendly, and then the people will be more familiar with them, and then they will, might follow them. Uh, user friendly meaning like uh, 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 remembering a password, or uh, uh, in a way that's more. You've seen probably all these things over the years, you know, where you've got uh, ten faces, and your password has something to do with you know the people that you do rec recognize from a list or you don't recognize from a list. So this is something that's much more. Um, I guess human friendly, but I don't think I'm the expert in human friendly. So. <laughs> I wouldn't know. It's a good. It's a good question. Uh, I think it's subject to, you know, uh, human machine interface. It's more more that type of research and how you can institute some kind of security together with that. Any other questions? Maybe we have time for one more question. Hello, can I audible? Hello. Maybe you can yes. say. Yeah. Can I repeat the yeah. So, hello, guys. Uh, my question was uh, the question that Sunday wanted about the uh, about cryptography after post computing, uh, quantum computing. So right now the algorithm that we use for SAT uh, to put it set five to three. I think uh, after post computing, it might be easier to uh, like decipher them. So what uh, what will where will cryptography stand after post quantum computing? And I also read about the thing that people can use photons to transfer data. So instead of using the traditional bit, we can use photons to transfer data. And I think it will be more private and secure. So where will cryptography stand after post computing? Sorry, quantum computing. Kathy, would you hear the question? I'm not sure I did. Was it about post quantum? It's about post quantum and also quantum. So the question is uh, you know, how will security be impacted post quantum computers? And then following that, uh, uh, said that uh, he heard that photons can be used to communicate information rather than traditional bits. So, how can that be used for? Um, Cryptography in the post quantum. So I'm not sure if I follow the second part, but in terms of post quantum, it's an incredibly active research area now. So at Simon specifically, there's a quantum pod that's run actually by Umesh Mazirani, who's the director of it. And um, oh, I think grew up in Delhi, partially at least. Um, and uh, I would say that most of the work on this uh, quantum pod is about cryptography and specifically post quantum cryptography. And there are two interpretations of this. One is schemes where even if the quantum computers will be built, uh, it will still, these are classical schemes that even when quantum computers will be built, they'll be still not unbreakable. So these are based on problems that even quantum computers cannot break. And there's, I think, great success with that. So um, this whole field of homomorphic encryption and function no encryption. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a lot of schemes that we know how to build with mathematics, which we don't know how to solve with quantum computers. Uh, and these, and so actually a lot, it's much richer than what we used to know when we didn't worry about uh, quantum computers and we just worked with number theory based schemes. That's one thing. So there's quite a bit in this. The National Institute of Standards in the US has actually a, a call out for schemes which are post quantum secure, both digital signatures, encryption schemes. Now they're asking, for threshold cryptography scheme for multi-party secure computation. Uh, I think the second part of your question was, can one use quantum computer to actually become more secure rather than think of them as enemies of security? 
And I think the answer is yes. So I think people probably might know the work of, of Broussard and Bennett, which is private key exchange, you know, so how to essentially establish a, a, a kind of information theoretically secure, based on quantum principles, uh, secure a private key system between two parties. So it's not a public key system, but this is based on quantum principles and it's actually a much more secure than anything else we know. It's actually information theoretically secure. And not only that, but there are other results that have been coming along like in, in this for realm of deniable encryption and other things that you actually take advantage of the fact that this quantum, the, the quantum computation has some interesting non-clonability uh, features that make it actually interesting for cryptography and get better cryptography. So maybe that I was answering the question, but I'm not 100% sure that I heard every word. Sorry. Okay, so uh, we're all out of time, unfortunately. So let's thank our guests again. Uh, we also thank uh, Microsoft Research for the excellent quality of the recording. It, it was really amazing. We really enjoyed it. And uh, as a token of our appreciation, uh, ACM India presents a momentum to Shakti Kurdwalsar and Satya Gopal. Uh, I don't have a way to show it to you, but let me tell you what it is. So a tree has been planted in your name, Shakti. And the tree ID is 63762. There's a QR code which we can send you. You can scan it to watch the tree grow. So this is a you know a sustainable momentum from museum India. And uh, the same for Satya. So Satya tree has also been planted in your name. And your tree ID is 63764. I'm just taking this out to you know, make it real for you. So uh, We'll have two happy trees in your name. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you, Satya, for being such a patient. Thank you, interviewer. Yes. You're yeah, a wonderful thank you. interviewer. Thank you. And, and I talked.